Uh, thank you very much. I'm very much um, uh, honoured to be here with you all. Um, uh, you've got a great lineup of speakers, um, and uh, I hope to follow in the footsteps of Mauricio, who's um, talked about reality. My title today is Can Physics Accommodate All of Reality? And I want to tie this in with um, an understanding and how this links with our overall uh, Sankhya and Vedanta picture <clears throat> of uh, reality. We've all had the experience packing up, you know, whether it's moving house, moving offices or whatever we do, we've got a bunch of stuff in front of us and we get a box and we think, well, this box will, I'll be able to put everything in this box and cart it away. As we put things in, we realize it's not going to fit. There are things I'm just not going to be able to squeeze into this box, no matter how hard I try. And we conclude we need a bigger box. And my suggestion is that is our relationship with modern physics. And um, this talk um, is uh, derived from uh, a talk I gave last week to the Joint Institute of Nuclear Research in Dubna, Russia, where 5, 000, there are 5,000 uh, scientists working on in nuclear science, and they wanted to understand quantum physics and consciousness. And to do that, they under, need to understand the role of physics, its limitations, and why we need a bigger box. So here it is. Physics has as its base currently quantum physics, and that gives rise to particle physics, which in turn gives us an understanding of how atomic physics works. And then from the atoms, we have molecules and we have molecular chemistry. In a more complex uh, form of chemistry, we have biochemistry. And that leads on to the science of neuroscience. And that becomes our picture of what physics covers from top to bottom. Now, the big question is consciousness. The su suggestion is that consciousness is simply a product of advanced neural activity, that the brain reaches a certain level of complexity in which it can generate this thing we call consciousness. But that is a very, very big question, which I will deal with in a minute. How is subjective consciousness produced from the physical properties and neural activity that go on within our brain? But there's a second question that is now being explored by many physicists. Is quantum physics the base or is there some realm of physics or beyond physics that lies underneath quantum physics that produces the rules and um, informs the way in which um, uh, quantum effects produce their specific outcomes? We're often told that it's simply random, that quantum physics defines probability and the outcomes um, which become manifest as tangible measurable properties are simply random uh, products of that. But that's a very big question. Is it random or is it that we haven't yet identified the causation that underpins quantum physics? And I would say this is one of the big areas that is now being studied by many physics, physicists in the world. But let's look at the first question. Um, that here is a, um, uh, an image produced by um, Christoph Koch, who worked with Francis Crick of DNA fame, and he was analyzing the process of perception. We have the external world, represented by this man walking his dog, light is bouncing off the trees and the man and the dog, and entering the eye of our observer here. That is sensory processing. The eyes receiving that light and turning it into electrical signals, going beep, beep, beep to the back of our brain. And there um, we have uh, neural activity and information is now present within the brain representing that external scene, but that information is now in the form of charges, electrical charges jumping from one neuron to the next, forming little patterns and represented by this sort of barcode that is uh, considered to be a neural correlate um, of consciousness. So it represents something we are perceiving. That's all fine. We know that this is all the good stuff. This is all the easy stuff. But the next question is the bit of an issue. How is it that that 
electrical data then generates the picture, the imagery that we actually experience in this whole process. Now, this is a hard thing to get our heads around because we take it for granted every day. We think because our eyes are looking out of the world, the world is picturesque. Therefore, of course, I see a picture. But we don't appreciate that, what, that the aspect of the outside world that we're looking at was only light. And that light has been decoded or um, into electrical signals and that our brain has only got electricity. It has no picture. Um, if you want, try this little, it's a kind of schoolyard uh, experiment. Take your fingers like this in front of your eyes, just a few inches, bring them together. And what you see in the middle, just in front of uh, your third eye is a little kind of finger sausage. Try it. You're seeing something and you have to see, understand you're seeing something that doesn't exist there. You are seeing something that doesn't represent the outside world. Why? Because one eye is sending um, information back. Your left eye is sending one uh, image back. Your right eye is sending another back. But these are being combined inside your head by the brain or by the mind. And it's producing an, an experience for you that doesn't 100% correlate to the outside world. So and it has properties, the properties that of our uh, vision. We have, we see colors, we see um, shapes and movement. We assume that we see them because they're on the outside world, but actually the brain has none of those things. There is nothing to do with color in the brain. There is nothing that is the actual property of color. It is a property generated by the mind. And this is considered to be part of the hard problem of consciousness that absolutely stumps neuroscience. How do you accommodate the qualitative um, properties of our experience, which are called qualia? How do you accommodate qualia into the physics that we know about light and neural activity? That becomes the hard problem. And that isn't even the end of it, because we then have to ask, why? Why is brain activity being converted into something, not by the brain, but by something else. Who is that for? What is that for? Who is the observer of qualia? Who is the observer of, ever, of all our um, internal perceptions? That becomes a secondary question of consciousness. So these are the issues that exist. And therefore we have to identify three different uh, functions that are happening. And we have to realize we can't put this all in the box of the brain. We can't put mind and we can't put consciousness into the box of the brain. They have properties which don't fit. They have functions which don't fit. So we have three main functions. We have physical functions represented in the brain by neural processing. We have the qualitative functions of the mind, mental processing, cognitive processing. And we have the functions of consciousness proper, the actual ability to experience and the sense of existence. These belong to consciousness proper and cannot be found located within the neural activity or the cognitive activity. So this gives us a kind of three function model of awareness. The body brain with its biological and neurological functions, the mind <clears throat> with its mental states and cognitive functions, and consciousness, which has its sentience functions. So brain, body brain complex, we've got mind, we've got consciousness. That is actually a unique contribution from the Vedic texts, because in the West, brain is conflated with mind and consciousness. And for many philosophers, even if they separate mind from the brain, they conflate mind and consciousness. But actually, we will only make progress in understanding their individual functions and contributions and how they can be <clears throat> taken advantage of and utilized when we uh, see that these are diverse, distinct uh, functions, uh, aspects of reality. And of course, just to complete the picture, we might as well have the outside world with its physical functions. So world, body, brain, mind, and consciousness. This is going to form the analysis 
that will follow today. And we know that there is sensory processing between the body and the world. That's the activities of our eyes, our ears, our nose, tongue, and touch, and so on. And we know that there is cognitive processing. The mind is taking that data in the brain and producing imagery, impressions, emotions, experiences that are then felt and are um, experienced directly um, by consciousness. So consciousness is responsible for felt experience and one other important function of consciousness, volition. And that will pay, uh, volition will demonstrate the link between consciousness, information, and manifestation in this world. So we'll come to that in a minute. But let's look at the uh, cognitive processing uh, aspect. Just to demonstrate that mind and, con mind and physical uh, processing are two different things but they can, be, they can influence one another. This is work done by uh, Princeton University um, uh, and the department, the Princeton Engineering Anomalous Research. It was part of the School of Engineering and Applied Science. And it was directly under Robert John, who was the Dean of Engineering at Princeton. They ran a program for 27 years from 79 to 2007. And what they were studying is the effect of human intention on physical systems, electronic systems, and even physical systems. And so they were trying, in essence, they were trying to see, can their operators, their subjects, the people they got uh, recruited, could they affect the behavior of these physical systems simply with their minds? So it's a kind of mind over matter um, experiment. And what they used were quantum-based random event generators. These are um, things that produce random uh, output, not from an algorithm, which isn't entirely random, but from uh, quantum tunneling. And in effect, the uh, counter is counting the number of electrons that uh, pass along a wire, come to a negative barrier, but which decide to go quantum and tunnel through that negative barrier rather than being repelled by it and pass along the wire. And you can count that, you can then calibrate your machine. And the subjects, the operators were asked either to raise the output, the, the baseline output is shown in yellow there, it just bounces around um, and uh, the base. But the subjects were asked, could you get the more uh, electrons to go quantum? and raise the output, or could you get fewer uh, to go uh, quantum and lower the output? And these are the sort of results they came up with. This is after 120,000 trials of those trying to raise. Um, the accumulation shows a very large deviation from the norm. Um, the uh, parabola line uh, shows the uh, uh, Z2 score. Um, so this is way above uh, Z2, you're close to three, four um, in this case. And for those trying to uh, reduce it, that was the deflection. So after a total of 800,000 trials, when they completed their uh, work, they accumulated every single result, the good, the bad, the indifferent. And they found that they had deviation from the statistical expectancy of one in three billion. This is serious science produced in a serious university demonstrating that the mind is capable of influencing physical systems in the form of, and particularly quantum systems. But they also showed that the same effect could be there in a mechanical cascade. Um, they, they even experiment with pendulums, functions <laughs> and other things. But um, this particular one with the quantum system was their um, uh, most persistent experiment and the highest number of trials. So how does it work? There's a famous joke, um, the scientist is looking, well, I can see this works in practice, but what's your theory? And science always needs a theory to attach things to. Unfortunately, modern physics, if it stays within its little box, can't produce a theory how mind could, could affect physical systems. Therefore, it attacks 
these type of results because it doesn't fit in the box. And that's not how science should work. Science has to understand that when I can't fit something in the box, that's the time to look for a bigger box. We need a bigger theory. We need a bigger understanding of reality to put these things in. So what I'm going to present in these next few slides is the attempt by Princeton University to try and create a framework by which mind can interact with physical systems. So on the left, you have the tangible world, um, the body, brain, and of course, everything else that's uh, manifest. And I've shown my little diagram uh, of physics from quantum physics going up the tree uh, to neuroscience. So all of physics is in that little box there. But on the uh, right of your screen, then there's mental uh, stuff. This is the mind. This is the um, stuff that we are conscious of, conscious mental states and functions. And Pear said, this, this is a key divide. And this is, seems to be the question. How are these two interacting in the way that we are able to show they interact? We know for ourselves that our mind interacts with our brain because that's what we're conscious of it all the time. But the fact that our mind can distantly influence physical stuff, that's a bigger question. How does it work? So what they suggested is that really there are four quadrants to this picture and that the physical world has two aspects. It has the tangible, the stuff that we can see and touch. And that rises from the quantum physics um, level, which you see kind of in the middle with the line going, dotted line going through it. But below quantum physics, perhaps there is an intangible realm of physicality where the, uh, for physicality exists as inf an information state, which is feeding through and informing quantum activity, which is manifesting the uh, physicality of those things we call particles and how those particles come together to form atoms, molecules, um, and produce the properties of chemistry, biochemistry, and so on. So tangible and intangible physicality on the left and conscious and unconscious states of mind on the right. And what they suggested is that the ta tangible or the physicality side, tangible is being informed by intangible. And on the mental side, conscious states are being informed and informing the unconscious states. So two-way interaction up and down within this um, matrix. And then what they're suggesting is that because they are um, all part of the same ontology, the way that they are uh, interconnecting is probably between unconscious states of mental stuff and intangible states of physical stuff. So the interaction is taking place there. And they described it like this, that under normal circumstances, we think our, we are directly interacting with the world. We, our eyes are looking at something, we see it, we get it. But, and they call that sort of the normal state. But this other one is what we call anomalous. And it's only anomalous because of the prejudice of physics, thinking that everything has to be normal. <laughs> but actually, we, we can really look at the anomalous state and suggest that it's the actual way in which mind and information of mind passes through the unconscious state of mental stuff into the intangible state of physicality and which then informs the tangible state of the physical world. And vice versa, um, that information is being decoded about the world and passed to mind. So we would actually uh, make this as a kind of adjustment to Pear's um, uh, model. And there's another important adjustment that the Vedic texts would separate uh, consciousness from the mind, that the mind contains uh, information that we are conscious of, but we are the observer of that, of those um, mental things. And 
this is an important analysis that the Gita gives, Puranas, the Upanishads, Vedanta, that the tangible world and even the mental world, they're under flux, they're changing. As Patanjali says, um, yoga, what is it? Chitta Vritti Niroda. It is trying to quell, to stop the Vrittis, the flux, the movement, the flow um, of the uh, Chitta, what we're experiencing within our mind. So um, both the physical world is, is controlled and changed by time. And from one moment to the next, things are changing. Physically, things are deteriorating. Maybe some things are growing. Maybe some things are staying. But things keep changing. They're moving. Um, whereas consciousness is that which observes the things that change. You are the conscious entity. At this moment, you are observing um, the screen in front of you. I, can, I am changing it here, and you observe that. Now you're observing it again. You observe those changes. You were the same conscious entity throughout. The things in front of you changed, but you as the conscious observer did not change. Therefore, although the tangible and mental worlds both um, are all within the domain of time. Consciousness is something outside of time. It is non-temporal. And in the Gita, that's pretty well the first instruction that uh, Krishna tries to establish within uh, Arjun's mind. You are not part of this changing world. <laughs> you are the observer. And later on, he says, you are the Kshetra You are the knower of that which changes. And all of this domain of time, um, your body, brain, and what, the, what your uh, comet, this is all part of the Kshetra, the field of your activities. So um, this is kind of our adjustment to it. Now, what we're suggesting is that consciousness is the only source of new information. In the domain of time, information is processed. There is information in the tangible world, in the intangible world. There's information in, that is represented within the mental stuff of our minds. And with it's, some of that is held unconsciously. We are not conscious of everything that is present within our minds or other people's minds. So there is the domain of time is domain of a lot of information. But the only thing that generates new information is consciousness. So the interesting thing is how is the flow of uh, information from consciousness into our mind and how that then goes down this green loop, if you like, and affects the intangible world of physicality and manifests the physical world. And this is the flow that um, uh, the Vedas, this is the picture that they give us of how reality works for us. And um, I've been talking to various physicists that we can demonstrate that this flow could be taking through the quantum physics and manifesting within our mind. And I want to introduce you to um, some work by uh, Stuart Hameroff and Sir Roger Penrose, both of whom I've met and discussed this with. Um, and their work on consciousness and um, uh, the, the brain. I don't agree with what they say where consciousness comes from, but what I want to present is the evidence that they have come up with, which indicates that there is a route by which consciousness, intention, and the mind can interact with the activities of our brain cells. So this is a, a typical neuron, um, the large uh, blue part on the left is the kind of main part in which there is the nucleus. Um, around the nucleus, there are these orange, uh, uh, yellow orange uh, kind of curves. That in this diagram represents the microtubules, which are cylindrical uh, molecules in which quantum processes are seen to work. Now, a lot of people thought that you can't get um, uh, 
quantum activities in biology because it's too wet, messy and noisy in quantum terms. But now they're starting to show that actually there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of quantum activities within biology and biology seems to rely on it. So the flow of direction is um, that uh, is towards um, our right here, um, shown by the red line. So let's look at um, what's happening. Charge builds up, positive charge builds up on the outside of the neuron, but it's held back by what is called the axon hillock. The axon is the long uh, line going to our right. Um, so there's a sort of threshold there which holds the charge back until it reaches a certain level and then the uh, uh, neuron will fire. And you would think that each neuron would have a very fixed threshold at which it fires. Because if it didn't, then, you know, the things are just going off well, however they like. But actually, the threshold is variable. That is a very big deal. The threshold on which each neuron fires is variable. It is not fixed. So the question is, what is influencing that variability? What is making it hold more charge back and not fire? What is holding it, uh, making it um, susceptible to firing earlier than it might otherwise have done? So uh, Hammeroff and Penrose have identified that the culprit, if you like, is the quantum activity produced within these microtubules. That it is somehow or other manipulating the axon hillock. And in this case, it has made it stronger and held back more charge. And in the next case, it has reduced the threshold and allowed the uh, neuron to fire. So if we've already shown that intention, the mind, can influence quantum activities in physical stuff, is it that the mind can influence quantum activity within each of our neurons? And that therefore at the basis of how our neurons are firing is manipulation by our thoughts. So this is still early science. We cannot say for absolute sure this is the root, but we can certainly say this could be a root. And we can certainly say that you cannot claim that a non-physical mind cannot affect the brain. You cannot say that. You cannot deny that the possibility just because of bias. We actually got a system here that could be the root in which the mind is directly influencing um, each neuron of our brain. So, Back to our picture now, and just in this final section, just want to kind of wrap up um, uh, the Sankhya uh, picture. So we have the world, body, brain, mind, and consciousness. And really the world, our body and our brain, that's the world of physics. That's the box that physics has. And the border we've said is quantum physics. The Sankhya system doesn't talk about quantum physics, but it does talk about subtle states of information. Um, of physicality. So it has this, and it puts um, those subtle states of physicality um, and mental states into a box called Prakriti. So the tangible and intangible, the conscious and the unconscious states of mental stuff all fit within this picture we call Prakriti. And this is the the world that um, uh, Mauricio was exploring through Shabda and the flow uh, of how uh, mantra, um, first emanating from intention of the mind, becomes established as subtle Shabda and which um, then uh, becomes information within the intangible realm, which then manifests in the tangible world. So there is a flow of information. Now, the understanding is that um, Prakriti at its base is undifferentiated stuff, but it can manifest the diverse properties of the intangible and tangible world. And it can manifest the different properties of mind and uh, in both the collective and unconscious state, as well as the actual forms 
that um, we find within our own minds. So Prakriti is the base, the substrate for diverse properties. The Western preoccupation with Cartesian dualism is very childish. Mind and the world interact, therefore they must belong to the same ontological grouping. And that grouping is Prakriti. However, what, um, so that then, our, we would take the same flow as the pair example did. And the reason is because pair and others in this field, in order to try and solve the theory, looked to the East. They examined the ideas of Sankhya and tried to bring them in. That's why there's a correlation. Sankhya isn't copying physics. Physics is copying Sankhya. But besides this, then there is consciousness. Consciousness doesn't fit within Prakriti. Prakriti is the world dominated by time, whereas consciousness is in the non-temporal. It doesn't even fit within the box of Prakriti. It exists outside it. But for us, we are shining our light. We are Svadrik. We are self-luminous. We are shining our light of Chitta onto what is there in the mind. And the mind is telling us what it's picking up from the body and the brain and feeding us imagery of the world and experiences of the world and consciousness going, that is very interesting, yes. But it's taking on a roller coaster of emotions because our sensory experiences of this world are sometimes wonderful but sometimes nasty, sometimes terrifying, sometimes painful and sometimes pleasurable. It's a roller coaster. And consciousness is going through this roller coaster. Why? Because it's identifying with the activities of the mind. The mind is processing everything of the world and what our body is experiencing. And it is feeding that. That is what's coming up on our screen of consciousness. And we are like uh, operators sitting in front of this computer screen, just lapping up whatever is being projected to us by the mind. But is that the only thing we can do? No, because consciousness is part of a bigger box. It is part of the box of Brahman, the total reality in which everything is, exists. And the big question is, what is the source, the ultimate source of all of this stuff? Is Brahman simply undifferentiated? Can't be, because we experience it as diverse. We know there's diversity within it. So Brahman accommodates diversity. Some people say that that diversity, Jagan Mitya, you know, is just uh, illusion, but it takes a lot of reality to create an illusion. So even if the, uh, there is illusion, that's diversity. And what is producing that uh, illusion, that's diversity. So Brahman must be diverse in its properties. Therefore, the uh, Vedanta suggests it has its own source. And what is that source? That source we call Parabrahman. Parabrahman is both the source and the totality, but it is the source and the totality of all the energies, everything that manifests within the non-temporal realm and within the domain of time. And just as a kind of final thing, because now this is where it kind of accommodates um, even a bigger picture than just our interaction with the world. Does consciousness only have to experience the mind and the, the domain of time and what's there in the world and happening in the body? Is that all there is for us to explore? Or is there an opportunity for us to explore the, the state of Brahman and actually turn away from just that which is time bound and enjoy that which is much more like us? The pure state of consciousness, Sat, Chit, Ananda, that where we're full of beingness, we're uh, full of knowingness, and we're full of, full of lovingness, because the one feature that consciousness has that nothing in the domain of time can do, only consciousness can love. And it's the experience of love that is driving us in this world. Why? Because we have turned away from what is the supreme love, our individual relationship as jivatma, individual conscious beings, and the paramatma, 
um, represented as Parabrahman, the source of all existence, um, known by many names, but um, I share Mauricio's uh, tendency and my, uh, in the last 50 years, my focus for that loving exchange has been Radha Krishna. Um, because this bigger picture reveals that actually where we really are going to find our happiness and our satisfaction is when the jiva turns our attention to the supreme loving object, Parabrahman, Krishna, and engages in loving relationship through the process of bhakti devotion. Thank you very much.